So this is the first of three webinars that we're doing uh, at the end of October here. Uh, so this is going to be uh, Upland 101, then we're going to do Upland 102 next week, and then Bird Dog 101. And uh, we'll have the dates for those at the end of the webinar. And they're also on our website right now if you want to register for those. Uh, for these, we've actually partnered with Pheasants Forever, and we'll be talking to them here in a second. But if you want to look up their information, there it is. We'll also have this again at the end of the presentation. Uh, so thanks for the partnership there, and we'll talk more to them in a second. Uh, just real quick. So course outline of what we're going to be covering tonight is going to be, um, we're going to talk about hunters and how hunters are conservationists. Then we're going to go over some brief upland game ecology, and then we're going to do a deep dive into regulations. So given that this is a 101 course, we will be focusing a lot on regulations tonight. Uh, on, the pre on the next uh, webinars that we have, 102 and Bird Dog, we'll be focusing much more on um, like useful tips and tricks and things like that. But tonight we're gonna be doing a deep dive in regulations and then talking about some land access and how you can find places to hunt. Then we'll do a brief uh, hunter safety while up on game hunting and a little bit of info about dogs and then talk a little bit more about the control hunt program that's here in Illinois. And like almost like a day in the life of a hunt if you wanted to go out and uh, try pheasant hunting. And then like I said, at the end, we'll have time for a Q and A. So our presenters tonight are going to be Dan Stevens. Dan, would you like to say hi real quick? Hello, everybody. Hello. And we also have with us Adam. Adam, would you like to say hi? How's it going, everyone? Thank you for joining us and hope you guys uh, find our presentation useful tonight. Fantastic. And then I'm Jason Buckley and uh, welcome. So tonight, uh, our special guest is Katie Kuzlarch, uh, who is with us here from Pheasants Forever. Katie, if you'd like to say hi. Hi everyone, thanks for uh, joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, so Katie, if you just wanna go over, here is uh, the different Pheasant Forever chapters that are across Illinois and also Quails Forever. And if you just wanna do a brief uh, spiel about what Pheasants Forever is about and how people can get involved with their local chapters. Yeah, sure. So um, Pheasants Forever uh, was formed um, in 1982 up in Minnesota, um, a very famous a uh, writer up there actually, unfortunately, watched a pheasant rooster uh, go out into a cornfield and freeze to death. And it got him thinking, he wrote this piece about, you know, the changing agricultures, what's gonna happen to our upland game bird species. And um, it really struck a chord with a lot of people, which um, led to the creation of Pheasants Forever. Um, so Pheasants Forever was the start. It's our longest of our organizations. Um, and we are a grassroots organization. Um, we are mostly volunteer led. Um, we have over 700 chapters in um, the United States. Um, in Illinois, we have around 63 to 65 active Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever chapters. Um, it, about 12 years ago, um, we actually started our second part of the entity, which is our newer part, which is Quail Forever. Um, that was formed. Um, there was an organization called Quail Unlimited that went bankrupt, unfortunately. So we decided to come in and kind of fill the void um, of their area that they covered because quail do exist across all of the United States, whereas pheasants do not occur. Um, they are an introduced species, but they cannot live in some parts of the United States. So um, we came up with these um, and our whole main model is habitat, habitat, habitat. Um, without good wildlife habitat, there is no point in you know, releasing pheasants, trying to save the pheasant population because if they don't have a home to eat, um, pheasant quail are not going to make it. So um, we work to empower and work with our volunteers to put habitat in on a local level. I um, mean, we do have about 15 employees in the state of Illinois that also work with our partners ranging from um, Illinois Learn to Hunt to the DNR to U.S. Fish and Wildlife to the USDA um, doing um, working with landowners to put in as much wildlife habitat as possible. So. Awesome. All right. Thanks a lot, Katie. And um, like I said, so in our next webinars, we're going to have guest speakers in those ones uh, through Pheasants Forever. So we'll have them talking about a little bit more in depth on habitat and a little bit more in depth on bird dogs and things like that. So join us for those uh, in the coming weeks here. But uh, to get to our regular Upland Hunting 101 webinar that we've been giving uh, for the past six months, um, we're going to get started off here with Dan and how hunters are conservationists. Thanks, Jason. Uh, yeah, like, like Jason mentioned, we always like to start off these conversations with, with kind of a, a quick discussion of why hunting is, 
is still relevant, particularly as society becomes more urbanized. Um, it's, it's still an integral part um, to, to how we manage wildlife in, in this country. So there's this uh, federal legislation that was passed in the year 1937, um, and it's essentially known as the Pittman-Robertson Act. Um, and this is an excise tax of about 11% that is placed on all hunting um, and shooting equipment. So anytime you buy a shotgun, anytime you buy ammunition, archery equipment, um, things like this, there is an excise tax that is then allocated to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And now the, the neat thing about this specific tax is that it's not an additional tax that you that's kind of rung up at the, the point of sale. Um, so it's not like, you know, you see that additional 7% sales tax or, or anything like that. It's already built into that, that price at the manufacturer level. Um, that money is then allocated back to the states. And there's an interesting formula on how they decide how much of this, this giant pot of money, how much each state receives. And that formula essentially looks at the total land size of the state, um, as well as the number of hunting licenses sold in that particular year. And so not only are hunters contributing this to this fund by directly purchasing these goods, they're also increasing the share of revenue that Illinois receives from the federal government by purchasing a, a hunting license. And the, the cool thing about this specific pot of money is that when, when it was written into law, it was very descript and very succinct about how it can be used. So it cannot be used in just a general you know, revenue fund for the state. It has to be used for the, the betterment of conservation. And so a lot of times this includes purchasing new land, um, so more hunting opportunities, as well as more target shooting opportunities. And so this is just one of those, those primary mechanisms um, for how funding or how conservation is funded um, in this, this country. But now we're gonna dive a little bit into the ecology of some of the, the species that we're gonna be discussing um, tonight. Um, Again, this is the, the 101 course, so this is going to be a, a, barely, a, a fairly quick overview of, of habitat. We're going to dive a lot more into this in, in 102. Um, but with pheasants, particularly ring-necked pheasants, it's really important to understand that these are not birds that are native um, to Illinois. They were actually introduced into Illinois in about the late 1800s. And it, it took several generations for these birds to, to begin propagating and to, to begin really, really thriving. Um, in, in Illinois. And so in, in about the 1950s, um, you saw a, a pretty big uptick in a, a huge portion of, of pheasants were, were on the landscape at that point. As we started shifting into the 1970s, there was a lot of different agricultural changes. Um, if you think back to, you know, the 1950s and 60s, a lot of Illinois was these, you know, 40 acre small family farms. Um, these farms are oftentimes divided by fence rows with lots of native vegetation present in those fence rows. And throughout the, the 1970s and into the 1980s, we saw a lot of these small family farms get converted to big, large scale agricultural operations. Um, so in a lot of cases, the fence rows were ripped out. And so a lot of that, that native habitat that these birds really thrived in um, began to, to be removed from the landscape. And so here's a, a quick just kind of trend graph that, that shows how, how far the, this population of birds has declined in the past um, few decades. So you can see again in the 1950s, you had really good bird numbers. And again, as that, that shift to large scale agriculture began increasing across the landscape, you saw that population trend start to decline um, right alongside with it. So there's a few really key components that, that wild pheasants need um, to thrive. The, the most important is native warm season grass prairie fields. So these are tall grass prairie fields. Um, you're probably familiar if you've been on a lot of DNR sites that have some of these tall grass prairies. Um, it's very often, excuse me, that they're kind of intermixed um, with agricultural areas. Um, a lot of times you'll see agriculture areas right adjacent to the, these prairie grass fields. And those are really good um, pheasant habitat. Again, pheasants really, really need that, that woody cover in those brushy areas um, to thrive as well. It's important to, to understand pheasant feeding behavior too. And as we kind of move through some of these hunting strategies, you'll see that a lot of times when we're targeting these birds, we're targeting a specific behavior that they're, that they're engaged in. Um, so in the morning, a lot of people will hunt near feeding areas because in the morning, pheasants are likely to wake up 
and go hit those feeding areas really early in the morning and then transition back to the thicker cover as the day progresses. Um, and then they'll do one last kind of feeding push right before dark. And so it's, it's important to understand the different habitat components that these birds are gonna use um, throughout, the, throughout a particular day. And so feeding behavior, again, we're really gonna focus on fall and winter um, for this presentation, because again, that is when um, upland season is. And so that's where we're gonna primarily focus. Now in the fall and winter, they're gonna be really focused on different seeds, um, grains, occasional roots and berries, uh, but you're really gonna see them focused again on um, crop seeds as well as some of the native seeds that are, that are out there. Um, so some of the smaller, let's say grain um, type seeds that you're likely to see pheasants feeding on um, can be oats, um, wheat, milo. Um, you'll also find them eating corn and soybeans. So there's a lot of different you know, agriculture type crops that these birds will, will readily eat. Um, in addition to a lot of the, the native sources of food um, that are out there. So just before we, we move on a little bit further, you're gonna hear us use some of these terms and we just wanna quickly identify them a little bit. So a female um, pheasant is often referred to as a hen, a male rooster is often, or a male rooster, a male pheasant is often referred to as a rooster, um, also a cock. And so if you hear us use these terms throughout this presentation, um, that just kind of gives you some, some background information on what those terms specifically mean. Now the northern bobwhite quail is a, another very unique um, kind of grassland bird. And this is what, what primarily um, upland hunters hunted for, for a long time in Illinois, um, as well as in many other states. Um, they are a native bird and they're kind of known for their unique bobwhite whistle. Um, unfortunately, I, I'm not very good at whistling. Um, so I can't really do it. But if, if you are kind of in, uh, you know, grassland areas in the spring, it's very common to hear the bob white um, whistle as they're kind of searching out for, um, for mates. And following along the, the same trend as, as the pheasants, you'll also see the quail population began to decline about the exact same time. And again, this is because a lot, in a lot of cases, these birds are utilizing some of the, the very similar areas. And so again, the 1970s to 80s, we saw fence rows being removed, um, pastures and waterways that used to be prairie grasses were starting to be um, converted to, to cool season grasses. And the, these cool season grasses, we'll, we'll get into it in a little bit, but essentially cool season grasses are, are the grasses that you see in your yard. Um, so your fescue, um, your zoysia. So these grasses that, that are almost what, what people refer to as sod forming. And so they essentially form a, a clean blanket across the entire um, bare ground. And so those are referred to as, as cool season grasses. And we really started to see those um, be implemented into an agricultural setting um, throughout the 70s and 80s. So quail use a, a similar habitat. Um, there, there's a lot of people that when they first think about upland hunting, they first start looking into um, you know, pheasant habitat versus quail habitat. There's a lot of similarities, uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of key differences that, that as a hunter, you need to be, be aware of. And I heard it, it kind of summarized best um, that essentially good quality habitat, good quail habitat is usually good pheasant habitat, but good pheasant habitat is not always good quail habitat. And so quail are what, what most people refer to as a more specialized species. Um, they require a very specific set of habitat requirements to be on the landscape for them to be um, successful. And one of the biggest, and you'll, you'll see it kind of in the third bullet on this particular slide, is this concept of, of woody cover. Um, while pheasants still need some, some aspect of woody cover, they don't rely on it as much as quail do. Um, in areas where, where woody cover is not present in these prairie grasslands, um, quail will typically not be found. It's very hard for them to, um, to make it through the winter months um, without this, this woody cover present. And here's a, a quick illustration just to show the, the two distinctions between um, a male and a female northern bob white. Um, as we get into the regulations um, a little bit later, you'll notice there are different sexual requirements for um, pheasant hunting than there are for quail hunting. 
Um, as a quail hunter, you do not need to know what sex they are before you pull the trigger, um, where on, on pheasants you do. Um, but essentially the, the biggest distinction between a male and a female quail is if you focus on that, that coloration on the face. And so you'll notice the female is kind of this copper tan color where the male is gonna have these bright white um, kind of cheek patches on the side of the face. So that's the biggest distinction um, but between the two. And one of the most interesting um, kind of behavior that, that some of these birds exhibit is the, the Northern Bob White and their propensity to um, what, what we refer to as covey. And so quail are extremely social. Um, and so you'll find them, particularly in the fall and winter, in these, these groups of about three to 20 birds. Um, and again, the, the, the size of that particular covey really depends on the habitat quality as well as the number of birds that are there. Um, but it, it's a really unique behavior in that it, it serves a couple different purposes. So one of the, the biggest purposes is the way they, they roost, so the way they sleep. And so if you look at this top picture, you can see these individual quail in this covey are essentially all tucked in together with their butts together. Um, and that's a, it, it's a, it's a great way to, to help um, thermoregulate and, and kind of save that body heat. Um, but another thing that it does is if you look at this bottom picture, that is a, a very common occurrence while quail hunting. Um, again, we're hunting in the fall and winter when these birds are actively coveyed up. And so it's, it's very common when you happen to, to find quail or when you happen to flush quail to, to see, you know, a dozen to, to 15 birds all flushing at once. And there's this concept in, in ecology um, looking, they kind of call it the, the flashing or the mob effect. And hunters suffer from it greatly. If you happen to see, you know, a big group, a covey kick up like this, it's very hard to convince yourself to focus on one specific target. And so over time, these birds adapted the same way. They, you know, the, the more birds that are out there, it's very hard for a predator to identify a specific target and, and take that target. So it, it kind of serves two different purposes, but it's a, it's a very unique behavior. I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting behavior and something that we can utilize um, as hunters. And it, it's very often when you bust up a covey like this or you flush a covey um, after a certain amount of time, you know, 30 minutes to an hour, those birds are going to naturally start coming together again. And so they're gonna start forming that covey back up. And so after you, you know, flush a covey or two, if you don't happen to harvest too many birds at a specific covey, you can then go and try to find that covey again. But now I wanna discuss the, this concept of, of native warm season grasses. And I, I know for many, this might seem a little dry, um, but this is one of my one of my biggest focuses as a hunter is understanding the habitat that the the specific game species that you're targeting uses. Um, obviously, we can all sit in a tree stand, and at some point, the chances are a deer might walk by your stand. But it's important as a hunter to to use our knowledge of the deer's habitat, the behavior, to put ourselves in the best likely spot that that's going to happen. Um, and the same can be said with with pheasant and quail. If you're hunting in an area, again, that doesn't have woody cover and you're hunting for quail, you might want to reevaluate things because chances are there's not going to be an abundance of birds there just because how much they, they rely on that specific habitat type. And so we're going to dive into this concept of, of native warm season grass prairies um, and why they're important to birds, um, particularly ground nesting birds like pheasants and quail. Um, they provide thick cover to avoid terrestrial predators. They, uh, you know, provide a lot of different escape routes. Um, they also serve a, a great purpose in the spring, <clears throat> excuse me, and in the summer when um, things are starting to green up. There's a lot of insect diversity um, in these specific fields, and that's really important in the spring and in the summer during nesting and brood rearing season. Um, the, the females and the young birds need a huge kind of source of protein. And so these areas provide that through the, the insects that they naturally um, attract. Um, again, it allows, you know, the birds to escape temperature extremes, whether it's a really wet day or a really cold and snowy day, these native warm season grasses are critical um, for, for both pheasants and quail. And this, this is a picture that, that I really like, and it illustrates 
you know, one of the, these points really, uh, really well. Um, and this is that, that concept of, of sod forming grasses like you may see in your yard versus, you know, prairie grasses. So prairie grasses are what, what are referred to as clump forming. And so if you look in this individual picture, you can see these individual clumps of grass. You don't have this solid kind of mat of, of grass like you do in your yard. And if you think about a newborn quail, so a newborn quail is, you know, about the size of a bumblebee when it's hatched from the egg. And so if it's, you know, trying to walk around your yard, you know, in, in three inch fescue, it's not going to be able to walk very far. Where in cases like this, where you have exposed bare soil, you have this clump forming grass, there's a lot of different kind of mosaics that they can use to move around. And so that's, that's one of the critical components of, of native warm season grasses and why it makes it so important. Um, for these these species. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adam and he's going to dive into regulations for us. Thanks, Dan. Okay, so moving on to regs. So what regs do I need to know? We're going to be talking about hunting seasons, bag and possession limits, licenses and permits, uh, a little bit of equipment, some clothing, <clears throat> regulations, and post-harvest procedures and also public versus private land. So first up here we have um, how to find the statewide regulations. So pictured on the right is the Hunting Trapping Digest. This is the new one that came out for this year's hunting season. And the best way to find that uh, is online nowadays. Of course, you can find the printed versions usually at Walmart or Cabela's or any sporting goods store. Uh, but I find, we all find, that it's um, best to download that onto your laptop, on your computer, on your phone, so that you can have it with you anytime you go hunting. Um, I have it on my phone, so every time I have any questions, um, you know, that come up when I'm in the parking lot or getting ready to get in the field, I can quickly look that up on my phone. Uh, and then that way I have, you know, answer, answer my questions and you know, I could get right to hunting. So, um, yep, I believe Katie just linked that in the chat. So be sure to check that out. But yes, downloading it on your phone or on a mobile device is definitely the way to go. So moving on to legal game. So for pheasants, uh, the statewide season is going to be roosters only. Uh, of course, you guys can see the nice uh, bright colors on him here on the left. Uh, as Dan mentioned before, quail, uh, you're able to harvest the male and female quail. Uh, this is basically due to the fact that you, when they, when you flush up a cubby, uh, they're usually so fast, there's no way to really tell exactly at the moment uh, which one you will be harvesting. Um, so you do have the ability to harvest both. Um, because they're just too fast. There's just no way to really tell when you're, you know, hunting and they're on the fly. So, uh, whereas pheasants, you can definitely tell uh, the, the hens versus the roosters. The hens are super drab colored. And of course the roosters are, are super bright like you see here on the left. Some other legal game, uh, Hungarian partridge and woodcock. And moving on to the hunter safety education course. So anyone born on or after January 1st, 1980 has to do their hunter safety course. Um, usually there are instructor led ones uh, completely. Uh, there are self-study and field day courses. Of course, uh, those are not going on at the moment due to COVID. Uh, but if you are 18 years or older, you can do your hunter safety course completely online. Uh, so that is, that is super beneficial. Um, and it really isn't that difficult. It is just time consuming. I believe there are about 10 chapters and of course, uh, chapter quizzes throughout and then, uh, chapter tests at the end. Uh, if you really wanted to, you can get it done in a weekend. You just need to dedicate some time. Next, next piece of information here is your FOID card or your Illinois Firearm Owners Identification Card. 
Uh, so regardless of who owns the firearm, Illinois residents who have a firearm or ammunition in their possession must have a valid FOID card. Uh, FOID cards are issued by the Illinois State Police and not by the IDNR, and they do have a 10-year expiration. Um, if you guys need to get a FOID card before this hunting season, I believe you guys are going to be a little bit out of luck, but it's still better to get your information in as soon as possible so you can receive that as, uh, you know, as quickly as possible. But they are very backed up from what we understand. Um, I believe it's a, at least a couple month waiting period, roughly three months as Dan, Dan says. So moving on to statewide upland game seasons. So you have your pheasant season, which is uh, opening up here shortly in the beginning of November. Um, you have your daily limit of two roosters a day and your possession limit of six. Uh, so your daily limit means how many birds you can harvest that day. Your possession limit is how many you can have in your possession at all times. So you can go hunting for pheasants and harvest two birds a day until you have six birds uh, in your cooler, in your freezer, uh, whatever that may be. Uh, when you have those six birds, you're legally not allowed to go harvest more birds until uh, you use up some of the meat, uh, give it to your neighbor, uh, whatever that may be. Uh, but you do have to use those birds. Basically, this is just to minimize waste um, and to make sure you hold hunters accountable for uh, you know, using what they harvest. So moving on to quail, that opens up the same time as pheasants. Uh, again, both of these are gonna be sunrise to sunset. And for quail, your daily limit is eight and your possession limit is 20. Uh, and then if you guys look at the, the dates that they open up, there is a northern and southern zone. So we do have the map here. Um, basically it almost splits the, the state right in half. Um, <clears throat> And it just allows the southern zone to have a little bit longer of a season. So hunting credentials and requirements. So to hunt upland game, residents and non-residents will need a hunting license, just your base hunting license, and a habitat stamp. Um, so those are the two things you need to hunt um, upland game. And of course, if you do read further, if you're gonna be hunting doves or woodcocks, since those are migratory species, you do need your HIP certification, which is free. You just need to remember to click that if you're buying your license online or make sure you, you remind the uh, clerk at the uh, checkout desk uh, at your local Walmart or wherever you buy your licenses to make sure they check that box for you as well. So again, here is a screenshot from the Hunter Digest. Uh, you just need your base hunting license, uh, which is usually 1550, and your state habitat stamp, which is $5. So for about $20, you guys can have all the proper licensing you need to go hunt uh, upland birds. So moving on to permit lotteries. So now the lotteries uh, for the upland game hunts are for the uh, free IDNR permits. So these are sites that IDNR opens specifically for upland bird hunting um, or upland game, I should say. You're able to harvest uh, quail, rabbits, and pheasants if they are there on that site. Um, it is, again, a free permit, but you do have to put into this lottery. Uh, so you have to make sure you apply for your certain permit for the specific site, uh, and you have to make sure you pick a specific date that you want to hunt. Uh, you can apply as a group for some of the permits, and you're not guaranteed a permit, but will likely get one. Uh, these are pretty cool. Uh, first of all, they are free. So, again, all you need is your, your licenses. But if you do draw one of these permits, uh, they are free and you're able to bring three other people along with you that day. So you have the whole site to yourself for that specific day that you draw. 
and you can bring a, you know, family members. They don't have to be hunters, but you can bring up to three people, maybe someone new that you want to introduce into hunting or so on. It's a great opportunity. Uh, and it's, and it's super cool. And there's usually a bunch of wildlife there. So definitely check those out. And then here in the white, here in the middle of this, uh, the screenshot. Oh, sorry. That's for uh, dove. Um, the top one. I'm sorry. Uh, it opens August 1st and ends August 31st. So again, uh, you guys would have to try to apply for this for next season. Moving on to the Illinois DNR Hunter fact sheet. Um, so this is going to be the sheet that shows you exactly what you need um, and exactly what you can hunt for each specific site. Uh, and also it will tell you any specific check-in and check-out procedures, whether you need a windshield card, um, if you need non-toxic shot, all that good stuff. This is where it's going to be. And they're different for each hunting site. Uh, so these are super important to read and understand uh, and get familiar with for each site that you want to hunt, whether it's for upland bird, deer, waterfowl, whatever it may be. Uh, this gives you all the information for that specific site. Um, they're super important. Again, I'm going to stress that you need to know all the rules because it can get a little bit confusing navigating all the all the rules for each site. They're not all just based off of what you find in, um, uh, in the rule book. So make sure to read these, uh, make sure to understand them and, and you'll be good to go. I will, I will just pop in to, to, to say really quick, Adam, um, it's important to remember site specific regulations. Um, they can be more specific than the statewide. Um, so the yeah. statewide are, are basically the bare minimum for every site, but then each site can go a little bit further in, in some of those uh, regulations. Yes, exactly. That's what I was trying to, to get to, but you said it much better than I did. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so moving on to post-harvest procedures. Um, so again, you might have some sort of check-in, check-out procedure if you're hunting on an IDNR site. Again, that'll be listed in the hunter fact sheet. Um, you must be able to identify the sex of the game bird and remember your bag limits. Again, for pheasants, you have a daily limit of two, possession limit of six, and for quail, you have a daily limit of eight and possession limit of 20. Okay, moving on to uh, some clothing regulations. So blaze orange or blaze pink is required for upland game hunting. Um, you need at least 400 square inches of solid, not camo, blaze orange or pink, um, and a blaze orange hat. So usually a jacket or vest and a hat will suffice. But again, it has to be solid blaze orange, not the camo kind. Uh, here, if you look on the right side of our slide, uh, you have a good picture there explaining what I'm talking about. It needs to be the bottom one, not the top one. So moving on to oh, legal methods of take. So to hunt upland game in Illinois, shotgun and archery equipment are the only legal methods of take that may be used. So I'll go over the pictures here quickly. Um, of course, here in the bottom left, you have a gentleman holding a bow, so that is legal. If we look at the picture here on the right, uh, kind of explaining what each shotgun is. Um, so uh, you'll see if you guys go pheasant hunting, a lot of people will have side-by-sides or over-unders. Uh, those are just kind of popular with the upland game um, hunting world. Uh, some of the pros, some of the cons, they are usually pretty nice guns well manufactured um and you know they're they are very nice kind of the downfall of them is that you only do have two shots so again if you are a new hunter and you're looking to buy a firearm uh, you gotta have you kind of have to consider all the different pros and cons and what you want to use it for um and they are they are very popular still but they are a little bit more of a 
I don't know, I kind of, kind of going to say like the older style of, of guns. Um, moving on down to the middle one here, the pump action. Um, so that is a shotgun that is able to hold three shells. Um, you do have to pump the forearm to eject the shell and load the next one in. Um, so it may be a little bit of a learning curve, especially for a new hunter. I uh, just kind of have to get used to your firearm, of course. You should be doing that regardless of whatever firearm you, you buy. You should definitely get used to it, but um, that's just an added step there. Um, and, of course, you have your semi-automatic or auto loader. So that means every time you pull the trigger, um, the shell ejects, and the next one is loaded um, by just shooting the first shell before that. This is probably the most popular uh, style of shotgun that beginners buy. Um, it is super nice um, in the fact that if you're definitely not used to shooting firearms, a little bit of the recoil is taken out because of the fact that it uses the recoil and the gas from the previous shell to load the next um, shell into the chamber. So it is a little bit easier to shoot. And again, you do have the ability to hold three shells in that shotgun. Um, so of course there's all kinds of different styles. Um, that's gonna be up to you guys, but just wanted to give you a quick explanation of what that all meant. <clears throat> so some regulations here. Um, upland birds, including migratory species, can be hunted with shotguns or vertical style bow and arrow. Uh, you need flu flu arrows only and no broadheads under the regulations outlined in the statewide regs. Um, and then squirrels and rabbits can also be hunted with a gun or bow, um, but the equipment may vary on the site. And then the last point is many IDNR sites require non-toxic shot, such as steel, but some do not. So again, check your hunter fact sheet. That is where all that uh, nitty gritty stuff is going to be listed. So again, some sites do uh, require you to use non-toxic shot. Um, a couple of points on that. Uh, of course, make sure to check your, or your hunter fact sheet for some um, ease of conversion. Note that the number three steel shot is ballistically similar to lead number five and steel number six is ballistically similar to lead number seven and a half or number eight. Um, so yes, steel and lead do shoot differently. Make sure to understand how both shells shoot out of your gun or just stick to one or the other. My preference is to just stick to steel. That way you always know that you're in the clear with IDNR rules. It is better for the environment as well. So some shotgun related regulations. You may use any shotgun gauge to hunt upland game in Illinois. Your shotgun must only be capable of holding three shells if your shotgun has the capacity to hold more than three shells, you must put a plug into the magazine tube to ensure that it can only hold three. So without the plug, most shotguns can hold five, uh, two and three quarter shells. Again, if your shotgun is able to do that, <clears throat> you have to put a plug into it uh, to be legal. Um, so you can only hold three shells. Again, if you buy a side by side or some sort of break action uh, over under You're, you don't have to worry about that because you can only load two shells at a time anyways um, but if it's a pump gun or a semi-auto you do have to worry about that and make sure and then here on the right are all the different gauges that you can buy uh, a shotgun in so starting from the top your biggest is going to be 10 gauge then down to 12 which is usually most popular a 16 gauge, a 20 gauge, which is again, uh, one of more, the more popular ones, a 28 gauge, and then a 410 bore, which is your smallest. So moving on to patterning a shotgun. So again, as I mentioned, it's best to pattern, or it's best to know 
what works with your gun, what kind of shells shoot the best out of your gun. And uh, to find that out, you're going to want to pattern your gun. So it is best to pattern your shotgun before the season to find the effective range. Use the same shells and shot size you plan on using during the season. So if you look at the picture on the right, a desirable pattern uh, has a nice um, spread to it. There's no big gaps uh, between any of the BBs. And, um, you know, it makes it a lot more effective if, if you were to be shooting at a pheasant, um, if you had that kind of a spread to actually hit it and effectively harvest the animal. Uh, whereas if you look at the one on the bottom, the undesirable pattern, you have a lot of uh, gaps and it looks splotchy. You know, you might get a couple BBs in the animal and you might end up just wounding it instead of, you know, giving it a, a uh, clean kill. And then the chart on the left is pretty interesting to know. Um, the shot size uh, and number are kind of opposite. Um, so the, the smaller the shot size, the bigger the number is. So just kind of remember that as you go to buy ammo. Usually all the boxes nowadays have um, written on there what it's meant for and what it's good to use for hunting purposes. Um, but it's good to know what shot size correlates with uh, what number actually and what you want to use it for uh, in hunting. <clears throat> so some choke to basics and selections. Improved cylinder, modified cylinder, and full are widely used for upland game hunting. Uh, note that a full choke may make it for difficult shot at close range. Um, here's a nice chart that kind of shows you what the effective range is for approximately for each choke. So your cylinder is about 25 yards, improved cylinder 30, modified 35, and full 40 yards. So of course, if you do have a burb that flushes at 25 yards and you do have a full choke, um, you know, you're, you're gonna have to really uh, try to make that shot count just because your, your pellets are gonna be so much tighter um, that you're gonna you know, want to uh, really aim. Yes, here, it was, Jason's pointing with the cursor. Um, you're just gonna have a tighter pattern. So it's gonna be harder to hit the bird if it's moving. So I'm gonna jump in for a second, Adam, really quick. <clears throat> um, one thing I, I wanna highlight, during, especially when we're discussing choke tubes, is you really need to, to pay close attention to um, the specific choke tube that you're using, um, as well as the, the shot type you're using. Um, so remember, steel shot, steel is a, is a lot more dense than lead. Um, it weighs about a third less, but it's also a lot harder um, than lead. And so that's going to change the way that it, it interacts with your choke tube. And so it's really important if you are required to, again, use non-toxic shot and you are specifically using steel shot, um, you want to make sure that the specific choke tube you are using is rated for um, steel shot. And normally you can, you know, look at that through the owner's manual of the choke tube, or you can look up that specific choke tube on the internet and find it, its owner's manual. But you want to make sure that you're using the right choke tube um, with the, the right shot, because it, it could be a little bit dangerous and it could damage um, the, the choke as well as damage the, the specific threads that the choke screws into. So if you are required to use steel shot, just make sure you get choke tubes um, that are designed to be used for um, steel choke. And it, it's also important to remember that to, to create an optimal pattern with, with lead versus steel, again, you're going to want different choke tubes anyway. Like Adam mentioned a little bit earlier, um, typically you want to kind of downsize in, in shot size. So typically you want to go up two shot sizes larger than the lead shot size. But steel shot also spreads less than lead ammunition. So you're gonna need less choke constriction to produce that optimal pattern. Um, so a good way to think of it is if you're using steel shot, don't ever put a full choke on your shotgun because that pattern using steel shot is already going to be super constricted just because it's steel shot. So you don't need that overcompensation. Um, so just keep that in mind as you are, you know, picking out choke tubes or looking into choke tubes that you do look into, um, you know, steel specific if, if that is required for, for where you're hunting. Thank you, Dan. And so 
Lastly here, shot placement. Um, so you're going to want to swing through your target for moving game. This tactic applies for all game birds. A kind of good way to think about it is butt, belly, beak, and bang. It's a good saying to remember. Um, and again, we have another picture here of desirable and not desirable shot placement and pattern. Um, so again, the one on the left is what you're, you're looking for. Nice even pattern at the front of the bird makes for an effective kill shot, uh, whereas the one on the right can lead to a wounded bird with you know a broken wing or something like that, something that you don't really want to see. So um, make sure to practice, make sure, again, to pair your shot correctly with your choke, um, and you should be in good shape. And this, this is where I always like to jump in and do a quick plug of the Illinois DNR Wing Shooting Clinic program. Um, if you are not familiar, Illinois DNR has a, a wing shooting program that is essentially designed um, to teach you how to effectively shoot moving targets with a shotgun. Um, obviously, with the, the current you know, COVID-19 restrictions, um, they did temporarily postpone a lot of the, the events that they have scheduled. Um, but essentially, they have two different clinic types. Um, so they have a beginner clinic type, which is kind of designed to, to, you know, you've never shot a shotgun before and you're just looking to get started. <clears throat> excuse me, but they also have a program called the Hunter's Wing Shooting Clinic. Um, I've taken a few myself as, as well as instructed at a few of them, and I can tell you without a doubt, um, it, it's some of the best time you'll have. Um, essentially, they designed the course to be very similar to a shooting, you know, a sporting clays type course. So they're going to have very specific um, stations set up that mimic what actual hunting-like scenarios are. Um, so if you've shot trap or skeet, you know, you're just kind of standing in one spot, shooting at the same target coming in from left or right or from in front of you. The hunter wing shooting clinics, you'll have targets coming from behind you. You may be walking through a field and they'll just randomly fly past you. They may have some come directly over your head. And so it's, it's a really good way to really hone in your shotgun skills. And the nice thing is it's typically you with a partner and you're going to be paired up with an individual instructor. And so you're going to get really key one-on-one -on -one time. Um, with a really good wing shooting instructor to hopefully help you kind of refine some of those those technical aspects. Um, and even myself, you know, I shot trap in high school and a little bit in college. And even taking the, some of the, the hunter wing shooting clinics, there are things that, that you cannot see that you're doing that impact the way you shoot. Um, so having a really good instructor there can be um, really key. Now, the, the beginner wing shooting clinics are free. The hunter wing shooting clinics do cost, I believe it's about $30. Uh, but that does cover your cost of ammunition. Um, and both of the hunter wing shooting clinics I've attended and the ones I've instructed, most students get to shoot about 100 shells. So you're kind of paying for your own shells and that's, that's about it. Um, so do look into those. I'm sure, you know, as restrictions ease um, in the spring, I'm sure these will kick back up. Uh, but it's a really good resource, again, just to kind of refine some of those technical aspects of, of shooting. Yes, and uh, Katie did put the link to that in the chat. So if you're not paying attention to the chat, you can go there now and uh, get that pulled up. Uh, so I guess I'll take over now and start talking about some land access. So this is a common uh, struggle for new hunters to figure out where to go hunting at. Uh, so the different types of land around in Illinois are gonna be your hunting preserves. So that's gonna be like your outfitters that you can go pay to go hunt there. Uh, we also have some public land that we're going to talk about how to find access to. And then we have private land as well. So for public land, uh, there's a new resource. And even if you are a seasoned hunter and you've hunted other species, I highly suggest checking this out. So the DNR came out this year with huntillinois.org. And they want this to be their one-stop shop for hunters and hunting information. And uh, if you go there right now on the homepage, they have a tutorial that will take about 10 minutes to watch. And it goes through all the different tools uh, that you can commonly use on the website. And it's extremely helpful, I think. And it kind of gives you an idea of what's there and how to use it. One of the more powerful tools that they've come up with is this hunt planner. And using this hunt planner, you can now narrow down and try to find a site uh, around you that is open for the game that you're interested in hunting in. In the past, you'd have to go through all the different hunter fact sheets and see what 
was allowed to be hunted at each of these sites. So they put in a database that allows you to search them now. So the, this is the first step. Uh, we don't have it going through all the steps, but the first step would be where do you want to hunt? And if you have a site specific name, uh, if you want to put an area that you're interested in hunting near you, or you can go by county, the region, which again is this map here, I'll go back. This is the traditional regions of the IDNR breaking down a state into their different management regions. So you can go by region and you can go anywhere, Illinois, so the whole state. Uh, and then it will say, uh, what do you want to hunt? And I think that's the most powerful thing because that allows you to then just pull up the sites that have the game that you're after in that area. So again, go check that out. And in 10 minutes, you'll be a whiz at using this site and hopefully help you figure out where you want to go near you. Uh, they also have this website here, not website, same website, different page on the website. So this is the hunt map. So they took all their sites and put it on a map. So you can see where all their sites are located at. Uh, you can go through the right here. This is a screenshot of it, but you can go through the different species and click on that. And when you click on that, it doesn't, what well, I would like it to do, but it doesn't do, but I would like it to get rid of the points that don't have those species. But that's what the uh, list is for in the previous email, or not email, the previous slide. But uh, for this one, uh, when you click on that, it will then highlight the areas where you can hunt those species. So if you're looking at a site and say you're looking at Newton Lake and you clicked on pheasants, uh, this is the part of that site where you're allowed to hunt pheasants. So where you see pink at is where you're allowed to go hunt pheasants. Uh, so here's some other public land over here, but there's no hunting over here. So just to give you an idea of this, this new site they have going and uh, they're trying to make it easier for us. So you gotta give them the credit where they, where they deserve it for sure. So we appreciate that site they came out with. Some other ways to figure out if a site is worth even hunting. So say you looked at Newton Lake. I just pulled that one up just because it had a, a land next to it that didn't have any pheasant hunting next to it there. But uh, you'd be able to be like, well, how many pheasants have been taken off of Newton Lake? And you'd look up the public land hunting report and then uh, you can go to pheasants and see if anyone's taken any pheasants off of there. Uh, you can see here a couple pheasants got taken off at uh, Bone Woods and uh, some other sites. So that just helps you get an idea of if they have the habitat there, uh, maybe it's part of the controlled hunt program, which we'll go over in a little bit. Uh, either way, it gives you that idea of what species are there, how many hunters are hunting it, and if it's being hit a lot or um, all that stuff. So it gives you an idea of the habitat's good there to go be hunting pheasants or quail. Uh, and then all these other species as well. And again, it gives you the total area of that land mass and the total hunting areas and the hunting trips taken out there. So it gives you the idea of the hunting pressure going on in that spot. And that's in the uh, IDNR website. And I believe you can find that at the new huntillinois.org website as well. Uh, they really wanna move everything over to that website. So they, even on there, uh, when you go to a specific site, uh, they'll have the same information on there from the hunter fact sheet, but almost rewritten in a more uh, easily digestible way. So you can go there and I think they're going to start kind of letting go of the hunter fact sheets and moving more towards that website and the formatting on that website. So the quicker you get used to that website, uh, the better off you're going to be going into the future. Some other sp spots that you can go hunting is part of the IRAP program. So this is a program that IDNR has partnered with private landowners and basically they offer up their land to be used in some format with the with hunting or fishing. And then the IDNR will then help them come up with a management plan and help them with some conservation projects on their land. And in exchange, they offer it up to hunters. So there's over 16,000 sites in over 38 counties so far that they've done this with. I think it's even higher than that now. Uh, I know they've been adding a couple sites this year. And uh, this is through a lottery to get access to this. And if you are a youth or a first time adult hunter for that species, you have a higher chance of winning that lottery. And to be a first time hunter, that means that you haven't hunted that species within the past five years. So you can go to that website and apply for that lottery <clears throat> to get access to some, some private land. Pheasants Forever also has some public fields that they have opened and this is also a lottery uh, for the first two weeks of the season. And then after that, it's walk on only. I oh, will not walk on only, then it's open up to walk on. Um, so you can go to the Fence Forever and apply for that free lottery to get access to their fields as well. 
So um, if it's okay, if I hop in on this one, um, I would suggest, you know, we, we do encourage and Victoria Fields is in Victoria or Forever Fields is in Victoria, Illinois, which is um, about halfway between Galesburg and Peoria. Um, it's a 508 acre um, complex that used to be strip mined. Come along with it, Caddy Corner, you do have um, Buffalo Grass Prairie, which is another pheasant hunting area. Um, but we, we do ask that if you are going to go hunt there, um, apply for our windsheared card um, and also do check the regulations. Um, the reason we have some of these regulations that kind of seem odd, like not allowing people to hunt upland before 9 a.m. is because we have a lot of little pothole lakes around there. So we do have a lot of duck hunters and archery deer hunters that also are util utilizing the site. So um, we do encourage people to get that come out. It is not going to be walking like going to a hunting preserve. This is going to be rough um, strip mine terrain, um, but we've, we've been flushing and hearing pheasants out there um, and it, it is open to the public and we encourage everybody. We've been working on it a lot, trying to get it better these last few years. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Katie. Uh, cool. Uh, so, so yeah, so there, there are resources for everybody out there to, if you want to go hunting, you can, you can try to make a plan and you can get out there and, and get out to these sites. Uh, so then for uh, private land access, uh, unfortunately, 96% of Illinois is private land. Uh, when it comes to public land, there's not much of it, but it is spread throughout the state. Uh, but uh, so just to put that in perspective, DNR owns about 1% of the state. And then the Shawnee National Forest in the southern part of the state makes up almost 0.7% of the state by itself. Uh, it can be difficult to get permission to go on some uh, private land. Uh, to find out private land owners, uh, you can look up plat maps and tax information. Uh, there are apps out there now. Uh, the most common one these days is gonna be Onyx, uh, Onyx Hunt. And that one is a subscribed app that you can get on your phone uh, or desktop and use that to find out some land owner's information and help you find them to contact them. Uh, if you're gonna go about the old fashioned way and do some door knocking, uh, that's okay too. And uh, you can, one of the biggest issues for people to go on someone's private land is the liability aspect of that. So the DNR has a small contract here that they have written up and you can maybe use this to help get over that. So it's basically an agreement um, between the landowner and a hunter and you can download this at the ID on our website. And basically the, there's an act that was passed that was like land use usage act uh, to allow people to use private land without them having liability uh, if you get hurt or injured during that time that you're using their land. The, when that doesn't work anymore or when that's voided, I should say, is when you exchange money. So if you pay someone to go hunt on their land, then they are liable for your safety. So keep that in mind. And then uh, just a reminder, uh, if you're not used to walking around the woods and seeing posted signs, if you're on private land or public land, make sure you know your boundaries. So look for no hunting signs or no trespassing signs. And the one that we're gonna be highlighting is the purple paint law in Illinois. So in a couple states, there is this purple paint law where if you see purple paint on a tree, that's just as good as a no trespassing sign. So if you're walking through the woods and like, I wonder what this purple paint's doing here. That means that you're real close to your boundaries and you should figure out where you're at just because you're on the wrong side of it or the right side of it. So pay attention to that. And then with that, we're gonna go back to Dan to talk <clears throat> about safety. Thanks, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks, Jason. Now we're gonna start tying a lot of this, you know, back into actual hunting tactics and, and hunting techniques. Um, but there's a, a few things that are really important for pheasant hunting. Um, particularly, it, it kind of revolves around the way um, that, that we hunt pheasants, but also in the habitat that we're hunting. We talked a little bit earlier about, you know, the importance of this native warm season grass prairies and, and these real tall grasses that can sometimes be six, seven feet tall. Um, it's really important to know where every single person you're hunting with is um, and to know where your safe zones of fire are. Um, and so you can kind of think of it, you know, the, the traditional way, and we'll, we'll illustrate this in a little bit. Um, more in depth later on, but it's important to remember when you're walking through a pheasant field with multiple people, you ideally want to form, you know, sort of a, a straight line. Um, and then you each kind of have that, that slice of pie in front of you. And that is considered your kind of safe zones of fire. 
Um, you don't want to swing too far right because then you'll have someone on your right and same on the left. Um, and so just again, remember where those safe zones of fire are. Um, another really important key aspect of pheasant hunting is only shoot at birds that are above the horizon. Again, these are tall grasses, uh, but oftentimes we're hunting with dogs um, and, and you may not know exactly where the dog is at. So the way I like to think of it and the way I kind of develop this illustration is when I see blue sky beneath the belly of that bird, that means it's kind of a, a safe shot because that means it's high enough in the horizon um, that, that nothing is going to be in front of or beyond my target. So just remember, wait until you see kind of that, that blue sky. And I, I will give a, a quick caveat here. As a, a new pheasant hunter, the first time you flush a pheasant, it's going to get your adrenaline going. Very often, um, quail are kind of the same way. They're going to make a really loud ruckus. Um, you know, the, the, the pheasant, he's going to cackle and he's going to start flying off and it's going to kind of get your adrenaline going. But you need to take, take a second. You have a lot longer than you think um, to take that shot. A lot of people, when they first flush that, those first few birds, they try to take that shot as quick as they can. Um, and oftentimes it's actually advantageous to let them get a little bit further away. <clears throat> and again, that allows your shot spread to increase kind of, you know, that way you have a, a more, a higher chance of actually hitting your target, but also it preserves the meat. And also more importantly, it gives you time to recognize if it's a safe shot. So when you do happen to, to you know, flush those first few birds, just be patient. Um, patience is a virtue. Now, if you are gonna be hunting with dogs, um, again, we do have a, a full bird dog course coming up, but we're just gonna quickly highlight some of the, the two characteristics of, of most upland bird dogs that you're likely to see. Um, so we kind of have two groups. And the first group we're gonna discuss is the pointers. Um, this is probably what most people are familiar with if you think about the upland hunting culture. Um, in a lot of magazines and movies, you kind of see these pointers. Um, so pointers, just like their name describes, they will go on point um, once they feel like they located a bird. Um, and again, this is gonna be very situational and it really depends on how the handler, you know, trained that specific dog. Uh, but very oftentimes the handler um, will tell that dog to stay on point and he, the handler himself, will designate somebody else um, to, to flush the bird um, so that everybody can get up on the line and get, get ready for a shot. Um, so if you happen to see a bird on point, um, don't just go rush up to where that, that bird dog looks like he's pointing at. Um, go ahead and let the handler make that decision. And he will either himself go flush the bird or he will point somebody else um, to, go, to go flush the bird. And again, the... the the big difference between pointers and flushers is that pointers have the ability to work further away from the, the handler and further away from the hunters. Um, as, as you see, when we move into the next group, the flushers, they don't locate a bird and go on point. When they locate a bird, their job is to immediately kick up that bird. So they're gonna immediately chase it. Um, and very oftentimes you'll see as this kind of top picture illustrates, they'll jump and try to catch that bird. And so that kind of illustrates back to that safety concept of allowing that bird to get high enough in the sky that you see blue beneath its belly. That way it clears the dog, it clears all the hunters, and you know you have nothing in front of or behind. Um, but pointers, since they're not immediately flushing the bird, um, handlers will very often allow those birds to get a little bit further away from the line. Um, so they may be, you know, 50 yards in front of the line, where with a flusher, you want them a lot closer so that if it happens to, to actually flush a bird, that bird is within your, your range. Um, so again, flushers, they're not going to, to wait until a handler says flush the bird. They're just gonna find that scent and immediately go and flush it. Um, and so, yeah, those, those are kind of the, the two groups of, of bird dogs. And again, if you're interested in more specifics about you know hunting over bird dogs, about training over bird dogs, um, we do have a Bird Dog 101 course coming up in a few weeks where we'll have um, some really good dog handlers kind of give some of their input and give some of the, the tips and techniques that they've, that they've utilized. But don't be discouraged. You don't have to hunt with a dog. Um, certainly hunting with a dog can make it easier. It's a lot of fun. Um, a lot of the pheasant hunters that I've, I've spent time with over the years, a lot of times the, the pheasant hunting is just kind of the, it's kind of the background noise. What they really enjoy is watching their dog work and working with their specific dog. Um, and so that's enjoyable for a lot of people. 
But if you don't have access to a dog or you're just not in a place financially or, or a place in your life where you're willing to take on the, the task and the challenge of training a bird dog, you can certainly hunt with that one. So instead of kind of working along the, the dog and, you know, using the dog's nose, you're going to be focusing on good habitat and where those habitats are. And so the easiest way to hunt without a dog is to have a couple people and just kind of walk in a straight line and just cover as much ground as you can. Um, and again, what, what a lot of people, and I, I was certainly guilty of this when I grew up, um, when you first start pheasant hunting and you're going to, in quail hunting, you're going to be walking through, you know, some very thick habitat areas. Oftentimes you might come into a brush patch and, you know, if it's getting late in the day, you might just wander around it. But very often those habitat differences. So, you know, if it's a solid prairie grass and then there's just a clump of little shrubs, very often those little shrubs are where the birds are actually going to be hiding. And so oftentimes if you're working without a dog, try to find these unique differences in the landscape, um, whether that's the edge of a habitat, whether it's kind of a little forest strip or a waterway, any kind of distinguishing characteristic can be, can be extremely useful. So now I'm gonna take you through um, kind of a, an overall strategy guide for let's, let's say your first upland hunt. Um, obviously first you're gonna to need to acquire the necessary credentials, licenses and permits, thoroughly inspect your equipment, make sure it's in good functioning order, and also confirm that that shotgun is plugged. And now when you get to a pheasant site, particularly sites, uh, particularly public land sites, they are all going to look somewhat similar to this if, if they have a lot of pheasant hunting activity. Um, this is a, a fairly standard pheasant hunting field in Illinois. Um, and my first step whenever I get to a, a hunting site with, you know, specifically with the, the goal of, of upland hunting is I want to sit down with all the hunting partners and figure out how we're going to hunt the field and go through a planning process. Um, if you think about that shooting line, again, you want to make sure everybody knows what portion of the line they should be on. If you have a left-handed individual, you probably don't want them on the left side of the line. You probably want to want a right-handed shooter on the left side of the line. That allows them to swivel a little bit further to the left than they could if they were left-handed. So these are the kind of things I like to try to figure out up front. Um, and also a step that may seem unnecessary, but it is a step I, I like to take is I like to divide the field into smaller, smaller units. Um, if you were to just look, luckily our example was kind of broken up for us, uh, but if you were hunting, you know, this big 40 acre field, breaking that into very specific units can make sure that you're covering the entirety of that habitat kind of in a, in a method that allows you to ensure you're covering it well. Um, so again, that's kind of my first step is to divide whatever unit or whatever site you're hunting, just divide it into to kind of several different units. And then again, before you, you start walking through the field, you want to, again, confirm all your firearm safety tips. The firearm should always be pointed in a safe direction. Um, the safety should be on and your finger should be off the trigger. Um, and obviously these are, you know, basic firearm safety principles, but they need to be adhered to drastically um, while you're pheasant hunting. Again, we're walking through very uneven terrain. And if that finger is on your trigger, what's the natural tendency when, it, when a body falls, everything kind of clinches up. Um, and if that finger is anywhere inside the trigger guard, it can instantly cause you um, to, to negligibly discharge that firearm. So again, follow these basic principles of firearm safety. Um, when I'm kind of getting on a, a pheasant line, I typically like to be at 10 to 15 yards um, between each of the, the hunters. And again, try to space out in a line as much as possible. Now, if you are hunting with a dog handler, typically that dog handler is going to be in, in the middle of the line. And also that dog handler will dictate the pace that that line moves through the field. So as that, that you know, dog handler begins, he gives the go ahead that the line can, can start moving. Um, that dog is typically going to be working in front of the entire line, um, typically about you know, 20 yards ahead, especially if it's a flusher. If it's a pointer, 
and the handler is comfortable with the way that dog works, he may let them go out a little bit further. Uh, but typically most dogs kind of work in that 10 um, to 30 yard range away from the handlers. And the point is that they're just going to be working back and forth across that whole field until they happen to catch the scent of a bird. Um, and that's, that's when you'll hear the term that a lot of dog handlers use is the dog is getting birdie. Um, and so this is, it, it's kind of a, a unique relationship between the handler and the dog. Um, every other hunter starts to think the dog's getting birdie and then the, the handler, no, not yet. And then that dog does something very specific that the that handler has recognized that, okay, he's found a bird, he's getting birdie. Um, at that point, the handler is usually going to announce to the line, hey, dog getting birdie, start getting ready. And again, if that bird, or if that dog happens to be a pointer, that dog will point until the handler either A, releases the dog or he flushes the bird. Um, so occasionally you will have a pointer dog that accidentally flushes the bird. Um, a good pointer dog will stay just far enough away that he's going to hold that bird right there. And so that hopefully the bird doesn't run um, kind of through these grasses and evade you guys. Hopefully that, that dog has a good enough point that he's able to hold that specific bird in the exact spot until the line gets ready to flush. Um, now, once that, that bird flushes, remember to be patient. You have a lot longer than you think before you need to take that shot. Um, every hunter who happens to see that bird flush, particularly if it's a pheasant, needs to yell rooster or hen. Um, remember, wild pheasants, we are only harvesting male, male birds, so roosters only. And so it's really important that whoever sees that bird first, everybody just start yelling rooster, rooster, or hen, hen. And that gives everybody on the line kind of that immediate, okay, it's a rooster, ready to shoot, or hen, hen, don't shoot. Um, so just keep that in mind, you will hear that very common. And as you are on the line, you should also be participating in, in that, that yelling. Um, then if it is a legal bird, so if it's a rooster, if it's a pheasant, um, or if it's quail, again, any of those, uh, either sex can be harvested, and it's in your safe zone, go ahead and take your shot. Now this is where it gets a little more difficult without a dog, um, is after the shot. Um, after you, you pull that trigger, if that bird happens to, to fall, you need to immediately mark where that, that bird lands. Um, particularly again, if you're without, without a dog. Um, dogs are very good at recovering the birds once they've been shot, but if you don't have a dog, it can be very difficult trying to find a downed bird in some of these uh, tall grass prairies. So just try to you know take all the visual cues you can of where that bird went down so that hopefully you can um, you can recover it. After that, if you are with a dog handler, the dog handler will release the dog to go retrieve the downed bird. Now I, I will say this about uh, the the dog retrieving the bird. Um, I've been with several hunting dogs who will only bring that bird back to the handler. Um, so if you know if you're hunting with a with somebody else's dog um, don't just go immediately reaching into that dog's mouth to grab your bird even if it's your bird um, very often they will only give that bird up to the handler um, so just kind of keep that in mind don't don't just go immediately and try to grab that that bird out of out of the, the dog's mouth but as you continue walking through this field and kind of covering as much habitat as you can focus on areas again that have a little bit different habitat composition. So maybe it's woody or brushy cover. Um, what's very common on some of these DNR sites is you can you can actually kind of see it in some of the, in the middle field particularly is they will mow strips throughout these fields. And while it's it's very tempting <laughs> to walk through some of these mowed paths, the birds are not going to be in those mowed paths. They're going to be in the thick cover, uh, particularly as the day progresses. And so if you're just walking through these mowed fields, um, chances are you're going to miss a lot of birds. So oftentimes you have to get in that habitat um, and kind of kick around some brush and just don't be afraid to, to walk through the thick stuff because that's primarily where um, these, these birds are going to be living. And, and if you notice in this picture, if you think back to the, the habitat conversation that we started with, um, we talked about the importance of, you know, this woody cover around edges of fields. Um, pheasants are what pheasant and quail are referred to as edge species. So they really like the, the, the habitat 
where basically two habitat types intersect, so that edge. And so these fence rows that you kind of see in this particular image make excellent, excellent habitat for both pheasant and quail, um, particularly on areas that are more heavily pressured. Um, so think public land sites that might get hunted a little bit more. Um, these, these birds are going to have a lot greater propensity to head to these thicker and, and kind of woody cover areas. Um, you also need to pay attention to the wind and the weather. If it's a really cold, um, whether it's rainy or snowy or even windy day, um, very oftentimes these birds will leave some of the grasslands and head back to these to the woody cover. Um, so don't just see prairie and just walk through prairie. Um, remember, both of these species need that 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 woody, thick cover component um, in their their habitat needs. A, a few other things that can impact um, the way the way birds flush. Um, thick woody cover can cause birds to sit a little bit tighter. Um, again, they in, in these thicker, heavy cover areas, they feel a lot safer from predators. They feel a lot more secure. And so they're a lot more likely to, to sit tighter. And so it might take you, um, you know, actually walking very close to, to pheasants. I've had several um, trips hunting, hunting wild pheasants where I've almost stepped on some of the roosters before they, they flushed out of an area. And again, that's just because they're so secure and so comfortable in that specific cover that they feel that safe, that they're not gonna flush until it's that last second um, kind of decision. Um, sparse vegetation will also call, cause birds to flush outside of shooting range. And so you'll hear a lot of people use the term wild flush. And so a lot of times what people kind of describe that is that you're hunting an area and you just have birds that continually flush maybe 75 to 100 yards away. Um, and there, there's a few things that can cause that, um, but typically that, that's going to be in, in very windy days um, or if the habitat is just not good enough that those birds aren't willing to sit longer. Um, and so that can be a, challenging, uh, but it, it, it certainly can be um, addressed. And that, that's kind of one of the things we're going to focus on in the Upland 102 section is how to play the weather, how to play the wind, and how to, you know, methodically hunt the, these areas in different conditions. Um, but for now, just, just kind of know that weather and habitat can impact how a bird flushes. Now, one thing I do want to highlight is the, the controlled pheasant hunting program. Um, and as, as we kind of started this conversation off at the beginning of the presentation, we kind of highlighted a lot of the decline that's happening in, in some of these species. A lot of states, Illinois included, have started a controlled pheasant hunting program to basically offer hunting opportunities, upland hunting opportunities, where they may not have existed anymore. Um, so it is a great opportunity to get the field. There are several sites across the state. We'll kind of flash up a, a quick graphic in a second to show you how, how many sites there are across the state. Um, they are about $30 per resident. But the nice thing is if you are just going to hunt these controlled pheasant hunting program, a lot of those hunting licenses that we talked about earlier are not required for the controlled pheasant hunting program. Um, and a lot of the other regulations kind of uh, differ from the, the overall statewide season. And so the big one is going to be, you're allowed to harvest hens on controlled pheasant hunting sites. Um, so you can harvest both male and female pheasants at these controlled sites. So here's a, a quick list. Um, I won't go over all of them. Um, if you just Google Illinois controlled pheasant hunting program, it'll take you, they have a, a specific website designed for the controlled pheasant hunting program. It looks like it was designed in the nineties, but um, it is all there, all the information's there. Um, so if that is something you are interested in, um, that's where you'll look. And now I'll, I'll kind of dive a little bit into what a typical day at one of these sites will look like. Cause I know for a lot of people, when I first started, um, and I decided to try one of these controlled pheasant hunting programs. It, it seemed a little bit daunting and, and really nuanced. And so I just want to clear some of that up a little bit and show you how easily the process can be done. And so the controlled pheasant hunting program, again, there's several sites across the state. Um, you can either register online um, and pay ahead of time. And now I will go ahead and if you are going to do the controlled pheasant hunting program, I, I recommend registering online. Um, you can, uh, I'll say that in a second. 
but register online. The way they basically figure out how many birds to put out at a specific site, a lot of times is dictated by the number of registrations online that they have. And so if you don't register online, then they don't know how many birds to put out. And so there are some issues with that. And if this sounds like a total canned hunt, um, I will say it's not, it, it is challenging. Um, essentially, they will just go out to the area, release birds. You know, you're not going to know where the birds are. You're still going to be hunting. Um, so just keep that in mind. Now, I will say with the, the COVID restrictions, they have not yet released their, their guidelines for the controlled pheasant hunting program. Um, I know they released some waterfowl blind guidance um, about two weeks ago, and then today they did some deer stuff. So I anticipate in the next week or two, um, we will have more guidance on how this process is going to work um, during this COVID era. Um, but I'm going to go through this conversation as if, you know, it's just a regular hunting season until we kind of hear otherwise. So again, you can either reserve your spot ahead of time online. Um, or there are standby. And again, I don't know if they're going to have standby this year during due to COVID, uh, but traditionally you can either register online or you can just show up to the site. And if there happen to be leftover spots by the time the hunt starts, you can quickly just go ahead and pay your $30 and hop in um, right there. But I do again, recommend registering online. It's easy, it's quick, and it again, ensures you have a spot um, to hunt. And now this is where it kind of depends on the specific site you are at. Um, you will check in at the designated sign-in station. Again, all that's going to be detailed on this controlled pheasant hunting website. Um, and when you check in, you will receive a permit and a back patch. So the back patch will just go right on the back of your, your coat or on your blaze orange vest. Um, and it's just going to be a big green, kind of like a marathon runner that have those numbers. Um, and so you'll have that on your back patch. You will either be assigned a field or allowed to choose your field. If you're one of the first ones to show up that day, um, you are most likely going to be able to pick your specific field. If you show up later, you may just be forced to, to being assigned a specific field. Before you, you leave for the, before you leave for the field, there's typically going to be a, a safety meeting, um, which will be conducted by the site host. Um, and I actually did just get a message from somebody who works at Des Plaines Conservation Area. And he said at their specific site this year, they will not have standby permits. Um, so that's just kind of a, a quick update. Um, so I imagine that will probably carry over to other sites as well. Um, but you'll have a, a kind of a quick safety meeting that will be conducted by the, the site host. Again, he's just going to, to go over some of the rules about the site, where you need to go to check in, where you need to go to check out, um, and these type of things. Hey, Dan. Yes. Hey, I know it's a little different this year because there's no standby line, but you said if you're one of the first people there, you get you might be able to get your pick of field. Um, about how early are we talking about here? Like how early does someone need to get to a field to try to get first pick? And they gotta like camp out overnight or is it like that? Again, it, it, it entirely depends on the site. And it entirely depends on the day. Um, if, you know, if you're trying to go on a weekend, you're probably going to have to get there fairly early at the, at the time of check-in. Um, you don't need to get there before check-in time, certainly, um, but, but try to be there a little bit early, certainly, if you do want to get your, your pick of the field. Um, and I will go ahead and say, if you're a brand new hunter to, to the site, um, through the Controlled Pheasant Hunting Program, let the DNR site staff know when you get there, hey, this is my first time. Do you have any recommendations for a field? Um, and they might be able to give you some guidance there that, yeah, you know, a lot of people tend to hunt this field or, you know, this field's really hard to hunt. So I recommend staying away from that field. So don't be afraid to, to ask and talk. Um, but you'll have, a again, it'll kind of wrap up with this, this brief safety meeting, and then they will send you off to, to your designated fields. When you get to your field, you will arrive at, a, at, a, at the nearest parking lot. They typically are going to give you a map with parking locations for, your, for the site and for each field. Um, do not begin hunting until the designated start time. At a lot of these sites, it's about nine o'clock. So typically, um, pre-COVID, again, you'll have that safety meeting at about 830. And then they will allow you to disperse and begin going to your, your field and to your parking lot to begin getting ready. Do not, do not, do not go into the field and begin hunting before that official start time. Um, again, 
most sites require you to stay in your assigned field for the first hour, where after that first hour, you can start to venture to other fields. Again, every site is a little bit different. And those th these are the kind of things that will be discussed at that, at that brief safety meeting before you're, you're sent to your field. Uh, but typically, you are required to stay in your assigned field for that first hour. At the conclusion of your hunt, you're going to head to the designated checkout station that they, they have set up. Um, you will record your harvest. They'll have kind of a, a log book there with your name already on it. And you'll just put either a zero, a one, or a two um, for how many of each sex you harvested. Um, now, if you did harvest bird, and I, I should mention, even if you did not harvest a bird, you need to go and still check out um, at, through this process. Now, if you did harvest birds, make certain that you grab preserve tags from the check station. Um, they'll have kind of a, a big, almost wheel of stickers um, that it looks like, and you just grab those off and put one on your bird's leg. And so what that does is it tells any conservation officer that this is a preserved bird, it is not a wild bird, and therefore it's not you know, susceptible to some of those other regulations that the wild birds are. Um, so just keep in mind, if you do harvest at these sites, that you need to make sure to put a preserve tag on your bird um, immediately after you check out. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jason. Sure. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, this is uh, the conclusion of our webinar. We're going to do some wrap up stuff here. But uh, I'd also like to thank Dan and Adam for helping out with the presentation, as well as our special guest tonight, Katie. Uh, for help. Thank you for all the work that you're doing with Pheasants Forever and for helping us line up our guest speakers for the next two webinars we have coming. Um, so thank you all for coming. And those next webinars are, are gonna be in the following weeks here. So we have deer stand placement on Thursday if you're interested in uh, looking at some scouting techniques and where to put your deer stand at. Uh, that's one of our more favorite webinars that we've come up with, honestly. So if you're interested in that at all, uh, please join us on Thursday night. And then those other upland hunting webinars we have coming on October 27th and November 5th. So again, uh, if you have any questions, we have time to answer those now. Uh, and if this is your first time uh, doing anything with Illinois Learn to Hunt, just to let you guys know that we're normally a workshop program where on a weekend, uh, you'll be able to come out and get your hands on some equipment and learn some actual skills uh, and get some hands-on uh, exposure to some of these things that you might not have in the past. Uh, so uh, hopefully one day we'll return to that, hopefully next year. Um, but as of right now, we got these webinars coming out. So uh, pay attention to those. We also have uh, some YouTube videos coming out. Um, I know later on this week, we're going to be interviewing a deer processor and talking about deer butchery and stuff like that. So uh, follow us on Facebook and our YouTube channels and things like that to get updates and our other content we're trying to figure out here during this strange time for us all. Um, also on our website, just quick plug, on the left-hand side, there are e-learning modules. So if you don't have time to sit through a webinar and you want to work through some at your own pace, uh, you can go on our website and look at the e-learning modules. They have topics on waterfowl hunting, deer hunting, turkey, and upland hunting, which has similar information to what we just covered just now. So we're here as a resource for all of you, and um, so please use us, basically. So if you have any questions or anything, ask them now, and if you think of anything when we're not here, feel free to email us or message us on Facebook. With that, if you guys have any questions, we'll answer them. And if you're going to leave, have a wonderful evening. I do want to plug the Facebook and Instagram page. Uh, Jason mentioned Illinois Learn to Hunt on both Instagram and Facebook. We also have a uh, Learn to Hunt Connections page. If you guys look that up, it's a private group. We can add you to it. Uh, it requires that you do take a webinar or a workshop, um, but that's where all past participants have been, or all the people on there have been past participants, and it's a great place to ask each other questions and learn a whole bunch of information. Some people are always looking for hunting partners and stuff like that on there, so make sure to check that out as well. Great. Um, I noticed we had a, a question from Matt. 
um, that I, I wanted to address. Can you do pheasant recipes in a webinar or page on this website? And that is a fantastic question um, and something where we have coming in the works um, during the, the 102 webinar, we will bring out a, a bird and, and show you how to process it and clean it and get it ready, uh, you know, prepped for a meal. Um, and then hopefully in the, the coming weeks, we're, we're trying to partner with University of Illinois Extension, who does a lot of these high quality recipe guides. And we're hoping to, to film some of those um, in terms of, of wild game. Um, so that will be something that hopefully will be rolling out um, fairly soon. I would also suggest um, we share it on the Illinois Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever website occasionally, but um, this year Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever are um, national paid Facebook pages. They are actively, we have partnered with several um, spice and meat processing companies. So we are actively putting out recipes and um, doing different blogs about different, you know, cooking and ways to prepare pheasant, um, grouse, quail, sharp tails, whatever, whatever we can find, so. Awesome. Um, Katie, I think you might be able to um, answer this question a little bit more than I will. John asks, are there any regulations for hunting with dogs, vaccinations or any type of registering? So um, you do, for regulations with hunting with dogs, um, you do need to sometimes take a look, especially if you're hunting a state site or a, um, public walk-in site. For example, we, it's not during the hunting season, but we have regulations that, you know, you can't have dogs out on our sites at certain times of the year because it disturbs the nesting. Um, it is, you know, a little, there's not really any regulations that I can honestly think of off the top of my head, um, other than, you know, respecting people's property lines, not letting your dogs run loose, which most of us aren't gonna want our dogs running loose. Um, for vaccinations, um, you do need um, rabies, which is just across the board with any dog. Um, there are certain, you know, some people, depending on your areas, um, distemper, parvo, those might be things that, you know, a lot of people recommend that, but there are hot spots around the state that it can come up a little more that you do want to um, check in. Um, so, Honestly, the best one is to talk to your vet about what they recommend, especially if you're going to be hunting your dog around your local area, because they're going to be the ones seeing what's what's coming in. If there's instances of a lot of parvo coming in or a lot of distemper, they're going to know, you know, that these are definitely ones you need. But rabies for sure is one that you are going to need no matter what. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Um, any other questions before we get going tonight? Um, if not, we'll see you next time we're in the field. Um, would a dog require specific training or will a well-heeled dog do the trick? Um, a well-heeled dog is probably going to be the last thing you want out there. <laughs> you don't want the dog next to you. You want the dog front of you. Um, there's a lot of training that usually does go into um, hunting dogs. Um, I, I've I hunt with a lot of flushers. Um, I mostly have flushing breed. Um, I do hunt behind some friends pointers. Um, and if you're thinking about taking a dog out into the field this season and you've never done any training with a dog, I highly recommend that you do not do it. Um, it's a great way to lose a dog and never find him again um, because we are hunting high cover. Um, you do want the dogs to learn specific behaviors, which we're gonna talk about a little more in the dog one, but you want them to do something called quartering or um, running. If they're pointers, they run loops um, around you. And that is not something that a lot of dogs um, will always pick up naturally. Um, there are groups that we'll talk about in the dog one that, depending on what your breed of dog is, um, North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association is a good group to go to. Um, there's a lot of um, retriever clubs and they will have training days throughout the year. Um, but I would really not recommend taking a dog that's never had any training out into the field because most likely that dog is either gonna mess up your hunt by getting too far out and flushing birds while they're out of range, um, or you're gonna lose the dog. And as somebody that's lost a dog for three hours out in the field, that is not a great feeling. So. <laughs> 
So now all my dogs, because they're little spaniels, run with GPS systems so I can look down and see how many <laughs> yards away they are from me after that. So, And, and I will say, um, th this is kind of another good time to, to plug the Pheasants Forever chapters. Um, if you are interested in, in, you know, pheasant hunting and, and eventually, you know, working into your own dog, there is a lot of really good dog handlers out there that just need to, to work their dogs even though they may not be hunting. And so very often, you know, if you get involved with some of these local chapters and local organizations, it's a really great networking opportunity to just, you know, start pooling your resources and, Hey, you have a pointer. Hey, I drew this pheasant field this year. Do you mind bringing your dog and you can come hunt with me on my permit? And so there's a lot of give and take and, and kind of, you know, getting engaged in, in some of these local organizations um, can, can really pay off in that, in that respect. And, and on that note, with the local Pheasants Forever and Quill Forever chapters, um, they get to kind of decide what they do with their money. And we have a lot of outreach. A lot of chapters are starting to do that. And I'm really getting sick of saying it, but on a normal year, um, we would be in full swing of mentor hunts right now. Um, and our chapters in the last two to three years, um, they're starting to do a lot more open mentor hunts so adults can attend. Um, they might have an event that says it's a youth hunt, but if you say I'm a first time hunter and an adult, um, a lot of the, a lot of the volunteers are all for having, you know, a first time hunter come out and join and they take you out and take you in the field, um, and get you out there. I know we've had a lot of the, um, Chicago areas. We've had a couple people go through these courses that have then actually went to a Pheasants Forever mentor hunt and done their first hunt there. Excellent. Well, I think that's all the questions. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and close it up. Um, again, I thank you all for, for joining us tonight. I hope you guys learned a lot. and We look forward to, to seeing you out in the field at some point and hopefully seeing you at, at some future Learn to Hunt events. Um, so again, thanks and have a wonderful evening.